Hey friends, here with a very special guest. His name is Gary Rose. He is the VP of New Nuclear Growth at Ontario Power Generation. And today we're gonna to be talking about everything to do with Gary's experiences here at Ontario Power Generation. It's actually his 35th anniversary here in the organization. And also we're gonna deep dive into some of the great initiatives that he's leading uh, in the nuclear energy industry. So welcome. Thank you, glad to be here, glad to share as much information as I can about my career and uh, what's happening in New Nuclear. Yeah, excited, excited for this convo. And uh, so Gary, why don't we start off with, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and, and, and what does nuclear mean to you? So I'm, uh, as you said, Gary Rose, Vice President of New Nuclear Growth, which means my role at Ontario Power Generation is I'm accountable for nuclear expansion in Ontario beyond the Darlington New Nuclear Project. So the Darlington New Nuclear Project um, is uh, being led by Dragan Popovich within the Enterprise Projects Organization. My role is now to look where else do we want to deploy nuclear in Ontario and what does that look like, what strategies are we deploying, what types of technology, et cetera. And I'll get into some of that details uh, through, through your questions. Um, been with OPG for 35 years. Um, I have three university level boys at this point, uh, married, live in Whitby. I'm active in my community. I'm uh, chair of the board at Durham College, uh, which is something I really enjoy. So, so maybe uh, tell us a little bit about your 35 years, right? Contributing to uh, this industry. And I'd love to know uh, the, whole, uh, the whole stages of your career and how you got started in this organization and, and where it led up to now where you're leading the strategic growth of small modular reactors, new nuclear. So we'd sure. we'll love to know more about that. Yeah, it's an interesting story. In fact, I tell the story as often as I can because I think there's some good messages in it. Um, I started at, uh, at Ontario Power Generation, Ontario Hydro uh, in 1988. I was 18 years old. I had completed two semesters of food and beverage management at Durham College, which is kind of interesting now that I'm the chairman of the board at Durham College, but that's a, a different story. So two semesters of food and beverage management and realized that that's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, ended up applying to a job and got a job at Ontario Hydro, in essence, as a clerk typist. I, I worked two days a week doing administrative work filing and three days a week basically in a mail room packing up brochures for uh, our energy management division. Um, I started there in 88. I, I uh, you know, enjoyed that, that those times um, in energy management. And it's, it's interesting because I started my career off in energy management where the focus was about using less electricity so we didn't need to build new nuclear. And now where I am 35 years later in a role where it's all about building new nuclear. So it's not lost on me how that 35 year cycle ha has happened. So. So anyway, I was in energy management after about five years in energy management in different roles and different capacities. Um, OPG or Ontario Hydro. So I keep mixing up Ontario Hydro, OPG. Ontario Hydro decided that we didn't need to be in this energy efficiency as heavy as we once thought we needed to be. A um, bunch of reports at the time had some incorrect projections of what the future energy demands were going to be. Um, and I ended up out of a job. I was declared surplus back in that time. Um, I was, um, for those that have been around Terra Hydro for a while, I was what they call a grade 62, which is basically a band three PWU uh, employee and, um, and was told I didn't have a job. So we all, like most folks that did at that time, there used to be a, a package of vacancies that would come out every week and we would go through them and apply to dozens of jobs, hopefully with something that was of interest. Long story short, I ended up in corporate finance um, and thought that, you know what, I'm 23-ish at that point in time, um, really didn't have a lot of education. Maybe it's time I go back to school, get some education to support that role that I was now in, in corporate finance. And quite honestly, I knew nothing about finance. I, uh, I was a food and beverage management graduate, or not even that, I dropped out of food and beverage management program. So I went back to school, I did my Bachelor of Commerce, uh, did my uh, um, Certified General Accountants, uh, which is now a CPA, Certified uh, Public Accountant, um, and um, worked in finance, grew up in finance. I, I shifted from through that, while I was doing that education, I moved from uh, um, uh, clerical roles to uh, analyst, MP, um, financial analyst type roles, and then eventually to the manager of the department that I actually went to uh, when I was declared surplus. Um, 
and that was fun. So um, over a few years, um, progressed quite well in the organization and management. And in the late 90s, uh, this thing called Y2K was about to happen. And uh, there was this fear that all of our IT systems at midnight on December 31st, 1999, would stop operating. And we started to go through this process of, of, um, of uh, replacing these old Vax mainframe systems to, to solve this problem. So I was a business process owner, but it was actually my first foray into project management, which was really interesting to me. And as I was going through that process, I went back to school. In fact, I went back to Durham College and got my project management professional designation, a master's of project management from, uh, from Durham College. Um, and I did a number of financial related projects in the late 90s, uh, including, um, you know, some people love this, some people hate it, but I led the project to deploy uh, Concur, our corporate business oh, wow. expense system. Okay. Yeah. So that was in 1999. Everybody was worried about Y2K. Um, I was asked to t lead this team to replace the business expense system. I had a great team working with that. Um, we selected the Concur technology. I was told that we were trying to do something that would take us over the next couple of years until SAP was ready and we would transfer to SAP. 20, almost 24 years later, that tool, love it or hate it, is still operating and we still use it at, at OPG. But, uh, but in that time, it was the first web-based, fully outsourced system OPG had ever deployed. So, so that was my late 90s. I was transitioning from being a financial analyst type financial manager, had my commerce and my CPA designation into project management. Uh, early 2000s, did some re-engineering projects in, uh, in, in corporate finance, including centralization of all the accounts payable processes. We went from 19 accounts payable centers down to one. We uh, partnered with a company where all the invoices were sent to that company scanned and then integrated in through workflow and through our, through our systems. You know, got to remember this is 25, 20 plus years ago. So we were very uh, technologically advanced there and many of those, uh, those processes are still in place uh, today. Uh, 2002, I had an opportunity to transition to nuclear, to the Pickering A return to service project where I was still in finance, but really doing project controls. I learned about this thing called earned value management and um, it, was, it really changed my career for the next 20 years. In fact, I think it's changed, it's changed my outlook on, on things. I, uh, I, I learned all about earned value management. I understand the value of understanding how much did things cost for how much work. It wasn't like finance where I had a budget and I spent it. Uh, this was really about I did 10 widgets and therefore I, I earned an amount, a certain amount of my budget and how much did it cost and I could do um, uh, CPI or cost performance index or schedule performance index SPI. So linking that to the schedule. And uh, you know, that really set me up onto this, this focus on project controls. Through um, the uh, Unit 1 RTS, we developed a lot of methodology for, uh, for product management. Uh, when we decided not to proceed with, uh, with restarting units uh, two to three at Pickering, I shifted and worked for product, uh, product modifications in a project called CSUP, Cost and Schedule Improvement Project, where we, we endeavored to put in a number of systems um, to, uh, to basically improve our, our timeliness of, of cost reporting. Uh, what was happening is we would find out that we were overspent on a job when the invoice came in. We needed to shift that energy to understanding where we were supposed to be this week and where we were at. So we did a number of things, a uh, number of system improvements to really get much, much closer to real-time data. And uh, that focus shifted, you know, in 2006, there was an announcement from OPG's uh, CEO at the time that the province had directed OPG to consider the... Uh, the decision to refurbish Pickering and Darlington, to evaluate that decision. I, uh, I sent an email to my boss at the time, uh, Jim Beach, said, Jim, um, I want to be a part of this project. And uh, nothing happened. Uh, about a year later, Jim called me and said, I want to introduce you to someone. He introduced me to uh, Pat McNeil. A week later, I was working for the, uh, what they called Plant Life Extension Program at that time. And that was about late 2007. Um, I had an opportunity then to work for Pat uh, in, in uh, evaluating her decision to proceed to refurbish Pickering or not, as well as Darlington. 
And I also worked for the Darlington New Build Project at that point in time. So oh, I was wow. basically financially supporting both those projects. Yeah. Uh, of course, we all know that at that time the Darlington New Nuclear Project didn't proceed. We made the decision not to proceed with Pickering at that point in time based on, on economics then. Um, but we made a decision to proceed with, with Darlington. So I shifted over to uh, project planning for the Darlington Refurbishment Program. Um, I spent the next uh, small, close to seven years leading the planning effort for the Darlington Refurbishment Project. And my team developed the $12.8 billion estimate that, that is the Darlington Refurbishment Program. We developed all the processes, the techniques, the systems, et cetera, to do project management well. And uh, we tested many of those in the early days of refurbishment, um, which have been deployed in Unit 2. And quite frankly, I think they're a big part of the reason why um, Darlington refurbishment is, is ahead of schedule and on budget is because we plan the job well and we set up the tools to monitor, to, to, to monitor and understand where we were supposed to be and where we actually are on a shift-by-shift -shift basis through excellent planning, but, but meticulous focus on, on execution and understanding where we are at. And if you're off track, doing something about it. Um, there's no point in having these systems if you don't use it, that information, to, 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 to do something. So, so I, I'm in refurbishment. I, I was here in this room when we, uh, when we launched uh, Unit 2 in October uh, 2016. Uh, I was still the Vice President of Planning and Project Controls at that point. I, uh, with Dietmar Reiner, represented the Darnie Refurbishment Program in front of the Ontario Energy Board, uh, which, which approved uh, $4.8 billion uh, in rate base, uh, based on a successful Unit 2. Uh, about midway through Unit 2, I transitioned from the role of VP, Project Planning and Project Controls, to the, the Deputy Vice President, working under Mike Allen, executing Unit 2, which was a fantastic learning experience to be able to come into the site every day, go down to the field and interface with the trade staff and the quality control folks, the people that really make these projects happen and understand from them what it takes to execute this type of a project and look for ways to help them and make it more successful and, and better it was a really, really great time. Um, I, I signed the in-service declaration of Unit 2 uh, for January 4th, 2020. So it's probably the highlight of my career. I'll look back. And you probably was a good year after that. Every morning I would wake up and I would check to make sure Unit 2 was still online. And of course, we, it was. It was, it was uh, you know, we had some challenges on Unit 2, but uh, proud to say it, uh, we, you know, it, it got in service. It operated very well from a quality perspective. Uh, we had a huge amount of lessons learned from Unit 2 that were packaged up and passed forward to Unit 3, 1, and 4. And it's a big part of why Unit 3, 1, and 4, or th Unit 3 and halfway through Unit 1 and Unit 4 to come while uh, why, why it is that we're, our performance is so much better. We, we planned well, we understood where we had opportunities to do better, and we implemented those opportunity. And under uh, Subo and the team that's executing refurbishment, they're, they're doing a fantastic job. Um, it's very important for us to deliver the Darnley refurbishment on time and on budget. Because um, quite frankly, if we didn't, I don't know that we would be having this conversation today about new nuclear. So in uh, late 2020, I had an opportunity to transition from the refurbishment program to work with Robin Manley and help them complete the, the planning um, to obtain approval to proceed with uh, the DNMP project. Um, uh, so we, that got approval in, uh, in uh, uh, November of uh, 2021. And uh, I transitioned from helping Robin, Dragon Popovich came in to execute the project. Now that we had sanctioned the project, to moved over to Enterprise Projects Organization. Dragon Popovich is leading, and my role shifted down to new nuclear growth, which was to really look at, as I said earlier, what are the opportunities to deploy more nuclear in, on, in Ontario. But also in my role, I do a lot of work helping um, other provinces. I sit on the Pan-Canadian, SMR Pan-Canadian team with, uh, with representatives from New Brunswick, from Saskatchewan, from Alberta. Uh, we are working together as a collective to resolve policy-related issues. Um, we are working with Saskatchewan to potentially help them in deploying their reactors. And I also get an opportunity to work with Laurentis Energy Partners uh, and talk about what we're doing here globally. 
Um, I had an opportunity last fall to go to Europe with uh, Minister Smith and his team and meet with folks in the Czech Republic, in Poland, in Estonia to talk about what we were doing here. And in fact, through Laurentis Energy Partners, we have a master services agreement and are doing work in Poland and, and have an MSA for, for um, Estonia, um, Fermi Energy in Estonia. We have delegations that come to, to uh, the DEC, the Darlington Energy Complex, to talk to us about what we're doing, uh, including today we had a delegation from Japan, we've had delegations from UAE, from Australia, from France, from Malaysia, um, North America, you name it. They've, it's a, I, I kind of jokingly refer to this as the nuclear's number one tourist destination these days. Uh, there is a lot of uh, countries around the world that are noticing what we are doing here and coming to learn from us. So anyway, that's a long story to tell you where I've been. I started off uh, in, a, in a clerical role and I had a huge opportunity to, to progress to different roles in the organization. And the message that I would want new people coming to the OPG to get from that is you can be anything you want to be at OPG. You've just got to figure out what that is. What do you want to do? And plan for it. Go after it. Don't wait for somebody to bring it to you. Understand what that role requires. Go educate yourself. Do stuff on your own time. Learn. Knowledge is yours and nobody will ever take it away from you. And go after those opportunities. Definitely. I love, love, that, um, love that motivation. And what a legacy, right? Like what a legacy you've led. And, um, and really appreciate wrapping that legacy in a nutshell, right? And progressively showing your, your career path, leading these, um, leading these major... Uh, nuclear successes for for the entire industry here, um, and I and I think one thing that I want to ask you about is the importance of nuclear finance. Right, we see projects across the world, and a lot of a lot of critics in the nuclear outside of the nuclear space say that nuclear is too expensive. Right. Uh, so, what's the importance of strategically planning these the finance behind these projects? like rate of return, the investment, the supply chain. So can you walk us through that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, maybe I'll start off with a simpler message than that. Mm. You know, it's a little bit of, you know, planning doesn't guarantee success, but lack of planning guarantees failure. Mm. And, you know, if you're unsuccessful on your project, you're, the, the likelihood of you being able to do that many more times is going to be a challenge. So when it comes to nuclear, um, we have to demonstrate that we can be successful. We think about refurbishment. If we, if we didn't do a great job on Unit 2, I'm not certain that we would have had the opportunity to, to refurbish the, the, the next three units. And, and I look at where we are with um, New Build, the DNMP project. Um, you know, the world is watching what we're doing, but uh, if we can't deliver, um, and there's going to be challenges. I mean, um, uh, it's, it's early. Uh, will we be right on budget? Will we be right on schedule for the first of a kind project? That's going to be challenging, but, but that is our, we've, we've got we've to set ourselves up to, to be able to, to do that. And, and that means doing all the planning. It means making sure your design is done before you start construction. It means taking a lot of time to understand your risks and develop and put them on the shelf mitigation strategies if those risks occur that you can go and do something about them right and uh, it's too often I see projects where the risks are thought about at the business time in the business case they're put on a shelf and when the risk when, when reality happens which they will and projects are risky risks will occur they are they're forgotten about mm -hmm. so you know I, I think that planning taking the time in the business case to understand the costs uh, obviously you're going to look at the cost from a capex perspective, from a operating perspective. You're going to do you're going to do an analysis to understand what the cost of energy could be. You're going to compare that elsewhere. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know these projects, these nuclear projects, are are expensive in terms of billions of dollars to deploy uh, these units. But the once they're deployed, if they're deployed successfully, they operate. You know seamlessly 24 seven day in day out um, for 60 to 80 years so it is a big upfront investment if you think about projects that haven't been successful unfortunately there's there's a lot of them in fact quite honestly mega projects in general are not successful I think the uh, 
the statistics indicate that 93, 90 plus percent of mega projects fail in terms of, of cost of schedule. So this is not a nuclear project. Mega projects are complicated. There's a lot of parts, there's a lot of people. Um, it, you got to recognize that and you got to plan for that. And uh, you got to build risk and contingencies in to deal with the, those types of projects. Um, if you look at Vogel in the US, there's a lot to be said about Vogel. Uh, it started off with an original estimate of, I believe, about $14 billion US and is landing at, at $34 billion US, um, I believe. Um, they had a lot of challenges. Um, they were the first to Westinghouse technology to be regulated in the States. Uh, they were the first to believe this combined licensing where you had to have all the design and the licensing and everything approved in advance. They learned a lot. Westinghouse, of course, went bankrupt in the middle of that process. They shifted from a lump sum to a, in essence, a time and material contract. Um, huge amount of challenges that were given to them. Um, their product is now coming online. Lots of excitement. It's expensive, there's no question about it. We need to learn from that to make the next projects cheaper. But it's going to provide 80 years of carbon-free power. Um, and although it costs more than originally planned, um, there's still a lot of value in, in having that nuclear project to provide, provide uh, um, carbon-free power, 24-7 base load power. The, the point being is that Vogel was more expensive, but it will still provide clean baseload power for a long period of time. Uh, we have an opportunity to learn from the successes of projects like Darling to Refurbishment. We'll learn from the challenges that Vogel had, and we need to apply those to these projects that we're doing here in, in Canada or anywhere elsewhere in the world. Um, and I, hopefully that gives you answers to the, the, the question, but I, I, I think that uh, you know, we need to focus on planning. Uh, we got to recognize these projects are complex. They will have risks and issues. We need to think about that in advance. And the worst thing we could do is to, uh, is to tell the world that we're going we're gonna to deliver a project for a budget and a timeline that is not achievable. You're just setting yourselves up for another failure. And uh, that impacts the industry as a whole. It's another mark on the industry. Um, we need to take the time to plan. Uh, these projects well and execute them to those plans and you know I think that'll help help our image of being too expensive. Absolutely no thank, thanks so much for going through some examples of, uh, of projects like Vogel or or even mega projects in general right and giving us a greater understanding of of, of you know the fact that mega projects themselves are, are expensive, right? Yeah. Um, the question I have, another question I have for you is, you know, you, you talked about how um, a lot of countries are coming to to Canada uh, to to recognize and learn about the expertise and experience that we have. Um, what are some of the top questions that they usually ask you and, and get guidance or what, what do they want to know more about? Why? It starts with why. I mean, yeah. why are you deploying an SMRs? Why aren't you deploying large nuclear? Uh, why, are, why aren't you deploying CANDU? That's, your, that's, the, that's the knowledge that you have. So it's a lot of education. I mean, you know, we've had, uh, you know, we've had uh, delegations from Australia here. We've had two delegations from Australia here over the last six months um, who are really learning. They are truly, I mean, um, I don't think nuclear, nuclear is, is outlawed in Australia. It's not a part of their, their they're not allowed to develop nuclear. Um, um, I don't know how else to say it than that. <laughs> Um, but they are learning. They're looking. They're trying to figure out how do they decarbonize their environment, and um, nuclear is the clearest option to them. Um, so you know, we get a lot of questions as to why SMRs. Tell us about SMRs. What are the different types of SMRs that you considered? What were what were some of the thoughts when you evaluated the SMRs that you did? Um, you know, when you when you talk with countries like Australia, or or more specifically. Poland or, or Estonia, the folks from, from those countries, they don't have nuclear right now. So they want to understand what are, what are all the things they need to do. So tell, tell us a little bit about the uh, decarbonization report uh, that came out from ISO. And what does that mean for new nuclear growth in, in Canada? Okay. Uh, so the Independent Electricity System Operator, ISO, as you called it, 
report called Pathways to Decarbonization was issued in December. It's a, it's a scenario of, of what um, the energy demands could be in a net zero, net zero scenario by 2050 for Ontario. And it, it, it calls out, um, subject to check, my numbers may not be exactly right, but it's calling out 17.8 um, or 17,800 megawatts of new nuclear, almost 18, 18 gigawatts of, of new nuclear. We currently have uh, just under 13 gigawatts of, of nuclear, base load nuclear at, uh, at Pickering Darlington and, and Boost Power. So more than doubling of our nuclear fleet uh, to achieve that scenario, which is uh, basically total decarbonization, electrification of, of transportation, um, residential heating, and large industry, right? So one could argue, is 18 the right number? Um, don't know, really don't care. It's a lot, is what I care about. Um, it is um, much more than one BWRX at Darlington, uh, or four BWRXs at Darlington, which is our, our plan. Um, it's going to require a substantial amount of, of new nuclear uh, over the next uh, 15 to 30 years to achieve these goals. So in terms of um, small modular reactor deployment uh, versus large nuclear deployment, what are your thoughts on uh, the future of that and in, in, in terms of the strategy behind SMR versus large nuclear? So uh, maybe break that down a little bit for you. Um, um, we've obviously made the decision to proceed with SMRs at Darlington and our goal was to deploy the first SMR at Darlington by, uh, by 2028, 2029. Our target is the construction complete by 2028, in service by 2029, because we need electricity. We need some electricity at the end of this, this decade. We need a lot more, in, more electricity in this decarbonization scenario at the end of the 2030. So as you close in on 2040, you need a substantial step up of additional energy. So we decided to move forward with SMRs um, at Darlington, one, because we had a licensed site, two, we had energy needs by 2030s. We also wanted to be, take advantage of being an early entry into the market. Uh, we are, our BWRX project is a first of a kind. It gives us an opportunity to demonstrate that we can deploy new nuclear projects. We've demonstrated that we can refurbish nuclear, but it's been a long time since we built new nuclear plants. So, you know, a little bit of walk before you run mentality, if I, if I use that analogy. Let's get the industry focused on deploying one SMR at Darlington, potentially three more SMRs at Darlington by the middle of the 2030s. And parallel to that, think about what else are we doing? So. What is the what is the what else? So if, if if 18 gigawatts is the right number, I can deploy. Our plan is to deploy up to four at Darlington. I'm still 16 plus gigawatts mm -hmm. short. Um, I look at the future of nuclear in Ontario from a centralized perspective and a decentralized perspective. And maybe this is not official terminology, but it's the way I like to think about it. Um, when I think about centralized nuclear. It's the traditional way we've deployed nuclear. We've got big centralized plants at Darlington, Pickering, and, and Boost Power. Um, those centralized plants produce large amounts of power and are distributed through a high voltage network, mainly across Southern Ontario. Um, we need, in order to achieve those, you know, that remaining 16 gigawatts or more, um, we need to look uh, for deploying more nuclear um, along the Southern, parts of Ontario where we can provide electricity to, to, to those high voltage grids for distribution of electricity in the traditional centralized way. Um, there are not a lot of land opportunities to deploy mm. nuclear. And for the land that we have, we want to maximize the amount of nuclear capacity that can come off of those sites. So, so you know, your question about SMRs versus large, I think in the south and the centralized way, I think large nuclear is going to be needed. Um, not certain of that yet, but if, if the financials are good and the schedules are good and we have the right technology and the right licensable technology, and I, I think we'll conclude that we do have all those things, I'm very optimistic that we will be deploying large nuclear in Southern Ontario. That's Gary Rose's opinion. Um, lots of 
socialization of that with um, Government of Ontario and OPG or Board of Directors, et cetera, to make sure that is the right way to go. But if we can de-risk large nuclear projects, which is a lot easier said than done, I believe large nuclear projects have a future role in Ontario. Interesting. That's and that's just from the centralized grid perspective, mm -hmm. right, um, for electricity. So where we're, so what about this SMR program that we, we talked about this, uh, you know, so we're deploying them at Darlington. I see more grid scale SMRs like the BWRX in perhaps um, Western Ontario, right? Um, maybe out uh, Lambton in Sarnia or Eastern Ontario in places like in the Ottawa Valley, I don't know where exactly. Um, I don't want people to, to run off and think that we're building new nuclear in the Ottawa Valley, but, but Eastern Canada, we have sites, that we have a plant at Lennox, we have other sites in Eastern Ontario that I think um, where you don't, you don't need to have that large distribution of electricity, I think SMRs make sense, grid scale SMRs. Maybe in central north Ontario. Um, you know, places where you need electricity, but you don't have a heavy, a big grid to go there. So th we've got, we're talking now about grid scale, large nuclear, in the centralized south on the high voltage lines. Distribution of electricity, we've talked about maybe decentralized grid scale SMRs beyond Arlington, at, at perhaps in the mid north, east west, maybe Atticoke and places like that could be good. Those um, 300 megawatts units are you know, Saskatchewan is also going to deploy that technology. Um, they're going to, they're looking to potentially replace coal plants with, with this technology on existing grid lines, right? So, and they don't need, at this point anyway, they don't need gigawatt class reactors. They don't need that amount of power. And if they did, they'd need one or two, and then they're putting all their eggs in one basket. So SMRs are really suitable for provinces that don't have the same energy, high level energy needs that we do. In, in Ontario, or provinces or countries, and we'll get to that in a little bit, that are removing coal plants, have existing grid lines that are 300 to 600 watts of capacity, and can put an SMR there. Mm. Perfect opportunity for SMRs. Saskatchewan's following OPG's lead, TVA is following OPG's lead, Synthos Green Energy out of Poland is following OPG's lead, deploying SMRs in their coal sites. Fermi Energy in Estonia just announced that they're and also deploy this GE BWRX technology. Um, you know, all learnings from what we were doing here in, in, uh, in Ontario. Um, and all of those, we're working with all of those jurisdictions to help to ensure that they are successful. So that's grid scale, large grid scale um, SMRs at Darlington, large grid scale nuclear plants, and per perhaps uh, uh, grid scale SMRs distributed throughout. But there are other applications for SMRs uh, we haven't talked about yet, um, industrial applications. So uh, OPG's partnered with X Energy, and our goal is to deploy X Energy where its primary purpose is to provide steam, heat to, to uh, replace um, combined cycle gas turbines that are operating at in industrial applications to provide steam or heat for whatever industrial process is needed. And, you know, I, I hear stories like uh, uh, some of these industries, you know, large mines in the north where they're going through 10,000 gallons of diesel a week oh, wow. to operate turbines to be able to bring steam and heat to their industrial processes. Uh, I see X Energy or, or high temperature reactors, whether they are X Energy is a high temperature gas reactor. Um, helium cooled reactor, but there are other um, uh, high temperature reactors. Uh, uh, New Brunswick is working with uh, Vents reactor concepts, ARC um, reactor. There's Moltex, which is uh, looking for in the future. There are other technologies out here, but OPG is working with, with X Energy um, with the goal to decarbonize industry. You will not achieve net zero without decarbonizing industry. And the beauty of that is if you could deploy those technologies in a co generation setting, and by the way, they're helium cooled. So they can go just about anywhere. They don't need large bodies of water like the other larger grid-scaled reactors do. They're helium-cooled, installed in an industry in a cogeneration type setting where the primary purpose is to provide steam or heat, perhaps some electricity to those industrial users. And when they don't need that, that steam or heat or electricity, maybe we can then 
put the power on the grid for other consumers. Right. So um, it gives us an opportunity to, again, I use that word decentralize, decentralize and deploy nuclear um, in a decentralized way, in a, in a, in a different way than we, we've used to. Now the last stream for, for, for nuclear in, uh, in Ontario, in some respects to me this is the most exciting one, it's a, is the opportunity to deploy micromodular reactors to remote communities to decarbonize remote communities and or smaller mines or smaller industries um, even, or even community settings. So OPG has a partnership with Global First Power, a joint venture called Global First Power. It's actually a joint venture between OPG and Ultra Safe Nuclear Company called Global First Power. Um, their offices are in Whippy, just, uh, just uh, west of here, which is kind of neat. Um, and they are going to deploy their first full-scale demonstration project at Chalk River by 2027 and demonstrate that a five megawatt micromodular reactor, five megawatt electricity, 50 megawatt thermal can be deployed and can provide electricity to a community setting, community hub setting. Think about the, the, um, the, the uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories or the old AECL site, Chalk River site, and uh, electricity and steam for heating of that site um, by 2027, not that far away. And the opportunity for that type of reactor is to replace diesel engines in remote communities in the north to provide electricity but also the, the, the USNC reactor is also a helium-cooled reactor. It's a different, different uh, um, fuel form, but it's a helium-cooled reactor, so it does, it's not dependent on large volumes of water. Uh, it's, uh, we refer to it as a nuclear battery. The whole idea is that you will fuel it, and, uh, and it will operate without refueling for up to 20 years. So you can take this, this very modular small reactor and deploy it in a remote community with very little... Um, operations and it can provide electricity, um, steam for heating, residential heating, but I, this, is what I, this is what gets me excited. Heat for agricultural, for greenhouse, yeah. so food security, um, but also heat, steam for water desalination. So think about a remote community that you can solve electricity, heat, food, water. I mean, it seems utopian, but it's not that far away from reality. And uh, that really excites me. So, so I think nuclear, you know, are the traditional way that we think about it as providing electricity is great. We're gonna need lots of that in order to electrify Ontario and uh, decarbonize Ontario ahead in order to achieve net zero by 2050. But to provide steam for industry and to provide steam and heat for remote communities as well is, uh, is really a, uh, an exciting and a new way to deploy nuclear. Absolutely, yeah, super exciting, and I really appreciate the two um, the two uh, categor categories, right? Decentralized versus centralized, large nuclear, small nuclear, and then micro, and then also painting a map. I, I love the map analogy that you gave of Ontario and potentially where where certain sites would be suitable. Um, tell us about and I know you were telling us a little bit about countries and how, how they are approaching OPG and, and Canada and looking up to us as a leader. In terms of uh, us being the first to deploy this small modular reactor technology, uh, how, are we, how are we developing agreements with other countries uh, where information sharing will take place? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So Salma, you are right. We are the first to deploy the BWRX 300 technology anywhere in the world. We will be the first. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, Saskatchewan, Tennessee Valley Authority in the U.S., uh, Synthos Green Energy in Poland, Fermi Energy in, uh, in Estonia have all stated publicly that they're deploying this reactor as well um, after us. So they will learn from our experience. And, um, but our partnership with, um, you know, as each of these countries are thinking about, countries or provinces are thinking about deploying the BWRX, um, we, for example, are working with TVA in the States. So TVA already has boiling water reactors. So we have an opportunity to learn from them. In fact, um, Dragon Popovich and his team have had people go down to TVA and, and participate in their outage training or on outages and learn about that technology. So that partnership is important. Meanwhile, TVA will learn from us 
on what were the challenges in deploying the BWRX and how can they learn from that and make their product more successful. So there's a great two-way collaboration opportunity there. <clears throat> when it comes to um, Saskatchewan, uh, you know, they've never deployed nuclear technology. It's new to them. You know, the nice thing is they got the same regulator. and So we have a standard design, um, same regulator. Um, we can leverage existing supply chains to the extent that it makes sense from Ontario. And we can work with, we, we OPG will work with Saskatchewan to uh, help them set up their nuclear program, potentially help them deploy the BWRX technology and perhaps work with them even in an operating capacity once this is, uh, once their reactor is, uh, is deployed. So we have 50 plus years of nuclear expertise. OPG's been recognized by Wayno as top level, top tier nuclear operator for years. I've lost track of how many years it is. It seems like it's uh, been quite a while now. So, you know, the, the operations team under Steve Vergoris at OPG have certainly um, deserved some high recognition for their capability. And we can share that with, uh, it's a different technology than we're used to, but, but nuclear safety culture and all the things that come with that, I think are very transferable. Um, to Saskatchewan once we deploy our BWRX here, it even becomes more important for Saskatchewan. Um, Synthos Green Energy in Poland. So uh, through Laurentis Energy Partners, who is already doing work in Romania, um, we have, uh, they have a master services agreement with, with Synthos Green Energy to help them. They are, again, a nuclear, they, they're not a nuclear jurisdiction, so they have an agreement now with the CNSC to help them establish a regulatory framework, again, common design, consistent regulatory framework, makes the deployment of these reactors in Poland a lot easier. So Laurentis Energy Partners is, uh, is there's a number of different uh, scopes of work that we're undertaking with uh, Synthos Green Energy right now, including help them to understand what's needed from a managed system for nuclear, what about schedules, what does it take, what are all the steps that are needed to get these projects launched and, uh, you know, meanwhile, uh, Poland is evaluating all their sites and figuring out exactly where they would put these reactors. So really, there's a lot of good synergy and opportunity, and a lot of lot of opportunity to to share our knowledge to 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 uh, Synthos Green Energy and help Poland decarbonize. Uh, huge, huge opportunity in Poland um, to deploy nuclear. Um, I, so the huge amount, and that doesn't even deal with potential growth and additional electrification. They have a huge district heating program over there. So, you know, I think Poland will look at both large and SMRs as well, as I talked about earlier, SMRs to replace existing coal sites and large for centralized, um, you know, grid scale distribution of, of electricity. And perhaps they'll look at advanced reactors as well for, for district heating and, and, and other applications. Um, we're working with Fermi Energy in, in Estonia with, through a master services agreement with Laurentis. And, and like I said, we have got a number of other countries that are having conversations. Uh, I think when they select, if they select the BWRX technology, um, it obviously creates some natural synergies for us to, mm. to, to work with these, uh, these, these other countries. If it makes sense, and it's got to make commercial sense, we, uh, you know, we are, we are, this is a business. Right. As much as it excites me to help um, uh, these other countries deploy nuclear, you know, we, we, are, uh, we are owned by the rate payers of Ontario, so there's got to be value that we bring back to yeah. Ontario. Uh, and I think the value is just through our services and our knowledge. Um, you know, there's some political, you know, some value to Canada from a political standpoint. Uh, but ultimately, it creates opportunities for our supply chain to export manufactured goods. So... Again, if Poland wants to deploy reactors in 2030, 2031, the fastest way to deploy that is to leverage our standard design, leverage our regulatory framework to the extent that it makes sense, and our vendors that have already deployed the same goods for our reactor here at Darlington. Uh, in terms of BWR, what about, Je what about countries like Japan or countries which have extensive experience in BWR uh, deployment? Are we, are we tapping into that resource as well? We, um, so uh, I don't have a great answer for you. I don't know what Japan's plans are. Of course, yeah. Japan is in the process of restarting many of their nuclear reactors. Um, you know, they are a small, densely populated, um, you know, country, right? When you think about the southern Ontario, the sliver along Lake Ontario, and think about Japan, it's kind of similar, right? Where you got a lot of large nuclear providing 
large amounts of energy for that local um, that, that those those energy needs. Um, um, they were there was representatives from Japan. There's been a couple different industry representatives from Japan. In fact, this morning I had a delegation from from Japan here that are again trying to understand why SMRs. This is the question today. Why why are you deploying SMRs? Why not large nuclear? What's the value proposition for small modular reactors? And you know, we so we gave the message. You know, there are jurisdictions that don't need large amounts of reactors, uh, large amounts of energy. You know, the whole concept of small modular reactor is and simpler reactors is that they are they're smaller, cheaper to build, don't have as long of a of a deployment cycle, um, become a little bit more investable because of that, um, become very attractive to countries that don't need. 1,000, 2,000 megawatts that need three, 600 megawatts and can replace coal. So we talked through that. What Will they proceed with SMRs? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think they're so focused on restarting their existing fleet and, uh, and figuring out how to renew that fleet. Um, we certainly had conversations about public acceptance of nuclear here, uh, especially following Fukushima. It was really interesting to talk to them about Fukushima and you know the fact that you know um, Fukushima was a was a tragedy, but the tragedy was really the tsunami, and the, and yeah. the uh, and the people having to relocate. The the nuclear accident itself didn't didn't kill anybody. Um, you know there are certainly things to learn from that. We we shared with them that when we go around and do a site tour, you'll see where we've enhanced our safety features in this facility and put Fukushima related. Um, uh, systems in place, so you know we learn from them, and and I think when it comes to Canada, we can demonstrate that we have an excellent safety record of deploying reactors, and we learn from Fukushima and make our reactors even more safe. And when we think about this new technology, the BWRX, um, they made it safety enhancements in recognition of the fact that the incident at Fukushima was due to the fact that they lost electricity and therefore lost the ability to cool the reactor. Mm. The designs of these BWRX 300s have additional cooling so that they can, they can cool the reactor for up to seven days or more uh, without operator interaction. When you start thinking about the advanced reactors like the helium cooled reactors, they will shut down. If they overheat, they will automatically shut down. Um, so there's been safety improvements to, to, to deal with some of the learnings from, from Fukushima to, to prevent recurrence. So, you know, that is an ongoing education to educate folks uh, um, of those improvements and... Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. Education is definitely important and I think this is this is part of it, right? Like yeah. sharing these stories and lessons learned from uh, from your experiences, yeah. uh, from, from your um, kind of day in the life and what you deal with day to day. And, you know, what are some of the challenges and what are some, some of the things that excite you when it comes to... Well, um, the, the, the excitement part's easy. I mean, everything excites me about this. If it doesn't convey it through even the camera here, I don't know what will. I, I, I'm yeah. certainly passionate about what we're doing here. Um, you know, I don't do anything halfway. I'm, I'm completely passionate. I think I'm fully engaged in what, this, what the potential of this program is. And, uh, uh, you know, the ability to uh, provide clean energy um, to decarbonize um, uh, Ontario uh, to help decarbonize. I mean, we're in a great spot in Ontario. We closed all our coal plants between 2005 and 2014. We're 93% clean in Ontario. I mean, you're probably too young for this, but I remember the, the announcements on the news about smog days where mm -hmm. there's too much pollution in the air. If you have yeah. trouble breathing, don't go outside today. Um, we don't have any of those anymore. That's largely due to our decision to close coal. And, uh, and on the backs of nuclear, quite honestly, some renewables, but largely Bruce Power reopening units, uh, uh, Ontario Power running their units better and more improved, better, better capacity factors, et cetera. Um, we've demonstrated that nuclear provides clean grid. We're 93% clean. Um, many jurisdictions throughout the world are years behind. They still are operating coal, um, like Poland. Um, it, this provides a, a huge opportunity. And, you know, if you can't be passionate about that, the opportunity to help deal with um, climate change, uh, to provide solutions to help meet net zero, to provide solutions for my kids and their kids to have a better 
future. I mean, that's, that's, that's what gets me up every day, so I have the opportunity to do that. Are there challenges? There are absolutely challenges. We're far away from deploying the number of nuclear reactors that are needed to achieve that goal I just talked about, right? Uh, you know, um, often get asked, are we in a nuclear renaissance? We're on the verge of a nuclear renaissance, but we got a lot of work to do. We got, there's a lot of challenges to one, demonstrate these first of a kind projects. We got to license those projects. We got to construct those projects. We got to prepare to operate those projects. We need to do it well, on time and on budget, to demonstrate that we can do this. Um, first of a kind projects are challenging. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be, there's tough, tough work ahead. And uh, then to do that three more times at Darlington, while Saskatchewan's also deploying it, while TVA's deploying it, and now we're talking about micromodular reactors, industrial reactors, more large-scale reactors, you know, it's a huge daunting challenge uh, to have the human capacity, the supply chain ready to do all of this, right? But I, I think of the 20s, the 20s are about getting ready for it, the 30s are going to be about making it happen, the 40s are going to be really about learning and optimizing that in order to achieve net 50. You can't wait till 2048 to start thinking about net zero by 2050. Um, so we're on the verge of a nuclear renaissance. We have a lot of challenges, but we have a bit of time to get ready. But, um, you know, I always think about nuclear, especially when I was planning the Darlington refurbishment. We were planning in 2008, 2009, and we were five years away from starting the refurbishment. And I used to refer to it as the day after tomorrow. And in nuclear speak, it takes a lot of effort to plan this stuff. So we need to be thinking about 2030s when we start to get into these projects and on scale. It's the day after tomorrow. We need to start thinking about, um, and, and we're doing some of this. What, are the, what do we need from the supply chain? Um, where in Canada, can we be self-sufficient in Canada to provide all the critical materials that are needed, the fuel that is needed, um, the resources that are needed to make this happen? Um, I spent a lot of my days, especially my, in my days from a pan-Canadian perspective, I've chaired a couple of, uh, of workshops now with the CNA talking about this human capacity question and with union leaders, with schools, with educators, talking about starting the program, starting to plan and think ahead for this. Uh, we gotta be careful. We, you know, the, the, the ramp up is gonna go slow and then it's gonna go and I don't, want, I don't want us to get a bunch of people ready that not have work, mm -hmm. lose momentum, yeah. right? So it's a matter of timing it right. But uh, there's a lot of work here, especially Darlington. We're still refurbishing uh, DNMP. We're still refurbishing, finishing up the refurbishment of Darlington by 2026. Bruce is still refurbishing their assets, I believe, into, into close to 2030s or slightly beyond that. Um, the potential to refurbish Pickerings. While all that's going on, we're still starting to think about building more. The good news is all those people that are coming from that refurbishment business, when that's all done, have they, have great they have great yeah. They have great opportunity. Um, there's, there's a future. I mean, some days I wish I was 10 years younger uh, because I think the next 20 years are just going to be so exciting. And, uh, you know, for any of your younger listeners that are listening here and thinking about a career, whether you're an engineer or an accountant like me or a project manager, huge opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Tradesperson, we cannot deliver these projects without trades. So if your son or daughter is interested in the trades, we need folks in the trades in order to deliver this nuclear infrastructure in order to meet these clean energy goals. So um, we need all of the above. And, and I think there are careers ahead for, for people that are truly interested in this. Challenges making sure we get it. We do these next few first of a kind projects well, so that we don't lose the opportunity. Absolutely, it's it, it's it's really inspiring to get a chance to have these conversations with with leaders like yourself because it just goes to show how important foundation that you're laying uh, for those future decades, right? And I love the I love the sequence of the decades that you just gave. That we have some time now, but the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s will lead up to something that we need to fulfill, right? Electricity, right? Electricity, it's, we've had it, it's always been on, but now we need to deploy these reactors and these reactors 
need to create that electricity reliably, right? So, right. Absolutely. yeah. You know, you referenced the, 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 um, the what I'm laying, right? You said, uh, you know, the, this basic, this infrastructure that I'm starting to lay of this, mm -hmm. these plans and these strategies. You know, it always makes me nervous. There's a little bit about me when you say, I'm doing this, because it's not just me. It's a team of people, right? I am, I happen to be a leader who, um, who gets, you know, I, I work in a company that has a great vision. I mean, I, you know, I've been with OPG for 35 years. I cannot think of a better place to have spent my last 35 years and great place to be right now. The vision that the OPG leadership team has in, you know, everything from the, uh, um, uh, the EDI program that we have, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion program that we have, the reconciliation action plan that we have, um, the climate change plan that we have, the vision to look at nuclear need to be able to give me the opportunity to communicate that lead, that need and help generate these projects, help convey that vision to the teams of people, whether they work directly for Marie or indirectly, there are teams of people across um, this company that are, and quite frankly, across the nuclear industry in Ontario and, and Canada that are all buying into this, this, this opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for the entire nuclear industry in, in, in Canada. Um, and all of the people that have worked so hard at Darlington refurbishment, at Bruce Powers refurbishment, to demonstrate and tell the world that we can actually make this happen, that we can deliver nuclear projects well, um, given us the credibility to have this conversation. If it wasn't for the successful refurbishments that we have had and the exceptional nuclear industry that we have in Ontario, we wouldn't be here. Right. So, yeah, I, I like the, I like to, I like the role that I'm in is fantastic. The opportunity to lead and have this conversation, but there's so many people with me. I'm, uh, I'm, I happen, I get to be the voice at times, which is great. But it's a, it's a large group of what seventy thousand plus nuclear workers in in uh, Canada that are, that are all making this happen by demonstrating day in day out the value of nuclear and working on projects that are, that are really setting us up for success. Absolutely, and it's, it's great that, um, that they have uh, leaders like yourself that are, you know, have that vision and have that, that clear goal in mind, right? Uh, what does leadership mean to you? You know, leadership, it's a funny thing for me, and this is probably not the, what you're gonna read in a book. You know, my role as a leader is to, um, enable others to do work, right? You know, my job is to uh, help set a vision, convey a vision. Often, you know, I'm, I've had leaders, I have bosses, we all get together, we have a vision, and I get to translate and communicate that vision down to uh, the folks that make these projects happen. Um, leadership for me is about being empathetic. I, I I, uh, I love to roll up my sleeves. I love to understand um, what the challenges are. I love to work with uh, the teams. I had the opportunity during Unit 2 refurbishment to go work on the lower feeder team um, in the field. And uh, we were struggling. We did not plan that piece of part of the work very well. We learned a lot of lessons from that. Um, it's such a great experience to be out there and not telling people what to do, but asking them what they needed to be successful. So that's what, I, to me, when I think about leadership, it's, it's enabling, the, setting a vision, sharing the vision, and understanding what it is that the, the folks that are executing the vision need. And if, if I can clear the way and help them be successful, um, that's, I've done my job. Uh, I don't look at myself as being a leader um, I look at myself as being a teammate. Um, I like to um, be involved. I, you know, of course, some day you got to be the boss some days, right? You've got to, you've got to lean in and you've got to set the vision. You've got to correct where things are at at certain points in time. But, but uh, you know, we talk about facilitative leadership at, at OPG, and to me, it's 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 who I am. I mean, it's it's all about relationships, working with people, communicating the value 
and that, with that, you get a huge engagement, and um, you know you can stand back and watch it happen. Um, that's what leadership is to me. That's phenomenal. I, I really enjoyed this conversation, Gary. Um, learn, uh, you learned so much, right? Especially about your career journey, about your vision for new nuclear deployment here at OPG, and also um, your your you know your your personality as a as a leader. Right, a facilitative leader who has that empathy and uh, that drive to uh, to 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 encourage your team and and move things forward. So, um, really, it's brilliant to learn about, about your successes uh, in the refurb campaigns, um, which have now led up to this crossroads with with new nuclear growth. So, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, do you have any last points or any last thoughts that you'd like to share with, uh, with the viewers? Just simply, it's a great time to be in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, opportunities are ours for the taking. Um, we need to work together. Collaboration is key. Um, we're going to have challenges. Um, the better we can anticipate and plan for those challenges, the better off we'll be in the end. Um, but. Uh, we have an opportunity to change the world, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, we're, we're Canadians, we're humble. Mm. But I think in this nuclear world, we have a lot to be proud of. And uh, I think we can help a lot of countries uh, achieve some, some great things. Uh, of course, we need to be successful first here at home. But, uh, but I'm, I'm very optimistic that the future is really bright for, for us and the opportunities are, 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 are just huge. Wonderful. I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.